tradition, I will recite the full main test of the things we think, say, or do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? It's my pleasure to introduce Timothy Bechtel for our guest speaker today. Tim received his PhD in geophysics from Brown University in 1989. He teaches science at the University of Pennsylvania and Franklin Marshall College. He's also the lead scientist for EnviroScan, working as a geophysical consultant. Now, EnviroScan does geophysical surveys, uh, on land and on the water. And one might ask, what is geophysics? Geophysics is basically like doing medical radiology, radiology to the earth, only, or to, only we do it to the earth. It's just like doing medical radiology. I refer to it as the science of looking for anything underground without digging. Tim has also been collaborating with a group of international scientists and they've been working on methods to try to detect landmines using geophysics. The current focus of their project is in the Vos region in eastern Ukraine. I've known Tim for a long time. Tim's been my brother-in-law for over 35 years, my business partner for 25 years. And I gotta tell you, Tim is high energy and is passionate about science. The other thing is that I can't think of a better example of someone who gives up his time and uses his talents and experience in trying to make the world a better place. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Timothy Bechtel. They gave me a microphone, but I'm going to do a test. Can you hear me without it? Because I tend to walk around and pace, and I might have it there and take it away. So I'm just going to shout. If you can't hear me, raise your hand, and I'll shout even louder. So what I've been working on is humanitarian demining. Uh, that means getting rid of landmines, not for military purposes, but typically in places where civilians are threatened. So we're doing it to clear farm fields and playgrounds and roadways that just regular folks are going to use. And I've had the good fortune to work with scientists from, I'm coming down here, uh, with scientists from a, a number of different countries and a number of different academic institutions and companies, one of them including EnviroScan Inc. Uh, here in Lancaster. They've supported this work terrifically over the, work, the years, not just financially, but by letting me travel and do all the crazy stuff I do. I think. You know what? I'm do the heck with the remote. I can just work the buttons. <laughs> Last August, uh, as part of this work, uh, I was on a project funded by the NATO Science for Peace and Security program. And we're looking at eastern Ukraine. You may know that in 2014, uh, Ukraine suffered somewhat of a revolution. Uh, they had, the Ukrainian parliament had negotiated a deal with NATO and with the EU, they were moving towards becoming a fully European country, which is good because they're the largest country in Europe by far. Um, and their economy is very large. Uh, does anybody have a bottle of sunflower oil at home in your kitchen? Go home and look at it tonight, turn it around and look at it, and I guarantee you that sunflower oil comes from Ukraine. They're the world's largest producer of sunflower oil. And lots of other things. So they would be a great addition to the EU, to NATO, the Ukrainian parliament had negotiated a deal, and on the eve of signing it, the Ukrainian president turned to Russia and said, no, we're going to see a, uh, sign a deal with you instead. And people took to the streets. They were not happy about this. Uh, after several months of, ma of massive and growing everyday protests, uh, the Ukrainian president finally fled, and Ukraine turned back towards the west. But in the eastern part of Ukraine, there are a lot of people who speak Russian, they're uh, ethnically Russian, their culture is Russian. They consider themselves to be Russian, so they weren't so happy about Ukraine uh, turning to the West. And actually, with a lot of help from Russia, uh, these militants in the East have declared a separate republic, two separate republics, the Donetsk Republic and the Luhansk Republic. 
and they continue to uh, claim that they are separate countries. They're supplied militarily by, by Russia. There are actually Russian troops in eastern Ukraine, not in Russian uniforms, but we know that they're Russian troops. So the fighting has been going on there for since uh, about April of 2014. And the, this area, the, the front line has now hardened, but it has moved, it's swept back and forth for many months. And uh, sadly, the, well, Ukraine has joined the International Landmine Ban Treaty that was signed in 1997. Ukraine has signed it, they, they've signed on. They claim to not be using landmines, and we have no evidence that they are, but we know that the militants in the east are using landmines supplied by the Russians. Uh, this is a bridge that we passed on the train in the town of Slovyansk. It used to be in the hands of the Russian-backed militants. Uh, it's now been taken back by Ukrainian forces, and the graffiti on the bridge says, here is Russian peace. Uh, also from the train window going through Slovyansk, uh, the eastern part of Ukraine has uh, really been devastated by this conflict. And right now, there's an offensive going on. Starting uh, late yesterday, uh, the, the Russian-backed militants have been shelling all along the front lines. There have been a lot of casualties. They are <coughs> evacuating the city of Avdivka right now. They're taking all the civilians out. But let's back up for a moment. So landmines are part of this conflict. And NATO has uh, asked our research group to address how we're going to get the mines out of these areas in eastern Ukraine where there's tremendously rich farmland, there are coal mines, there may be oil and gas resources. How are we going to clean this place up when the conflict ends? <clears throat> so we'll back up to mines. There was, in 1997, uh, largely because of Princess Diana, uh, many countries in the world signed a mine ban treaty, the, the anti-personnel mine ban treaty. At the moment, there are 162 parties that have signed it. 162 countries have signed it and implemented it. There's been one new signatory in just the last year. The Marshall Islands in the Pacific signed it. That's good. We don't have to worry about them, the Marshall Islands, planting landmines anywhere now. It's really wonderful. And there's one new commitment, and that's Sri Lanka. And this one's big, because Sri Lanka has saw a civil war for many years during the 80s and 90s. So there are a lot of landmines in Sri Lanka. This is one of the places we need to worry about. But they have now signed, the, they have committed to signing the treaty. Uh, in the past year, there has been no use of any landmines by any of the signatories to the treaty. So people are honoring this treaty. There are non-party nations that have deployed new mines, and we know this. Myanmar, North Korea, <coughs> Syria, and Russia have all created new minefields in the last year. None of them have signed the treaty. And there are non-party countries that are maintaining existing minefields. They haven't planted any new mines, but are maintaining minefields that they already had. And those include China, India, Israel, Pakistan, Russia, South Korea, and United States. us, the USA. We have minefields that we still maintain, and we have refused to sign the treaty. <coughs> the worst problem, though, may come from the non-state armed groups, the, the rebel groups, the uh, uh, militant groups that aren't a nation themselves, but they are the, they are the people who are more like, most likely to use landmines, and these non-state armed groups have used them in Afghanistan, Colombia, you've probably heard of the FARC rebels in Colombia, Colombia is one of the most landmine infested countries in the world, and it's right here in our hemisphere, in, in Central America. Uh, Iraq, Myanmar, Nigeria, Pakistan, Syria, <coughs> Ukraine, of course, and Yemen. Casualties have actually gone up. Casualties have been declining year by year since 1997, and in the last two years, they've increased. This is really a bad thing. We thought we had this under control and the world was getting better, but in the last few years, it's gotten worse. Uh, there were 6,461 victims of landmines last year. Mostly, most of those were in Libya, Syria, Ukraine, and Yemen. But in 56 total countries, there were landmine casualties. 80% of them are civilian. So landmines, although are a military weapon, do not affect military personnel. They affect civilians. 80% of the casualties last year were civilians. 40% of them were children, and 12% of them were women. Well, female, though some of them were girls as well. So where are these mines? Uh, this is the map from Landmine Monitor that shows the infestation in various places. The dark brown is where it's the worst. Red is bad. Uh, 
green and white get a little bit better. So you can see that there are there is tremendous infestation in, for instance, Iraq. Now come on up here. So Iraq, a lot of landmines. Turkey, uh, Thailand, uh, Cambodia. But what you really need to look at here are some of the gray countries where we just don't have data. And a lot of these we don't have data because there's an active conflict going on. So Yemen, there's a civil war in Yemen. We don't know. This should probably be the dark red. It's got to be that. Uh, if we look in Central Europe at uh, Ukraine, uh, there's no data in Ukraine. We don't really know how many are there. Um, in all of Vietnam, we know there are mines there left over from years of conflict, but we don't have data. So it's really a worldwide problem. If you look at the dark red colors and the gray, uh, it's all over the world. Here's the big problem with humanitarian demining. That is, there are various ways to find landmines. These are things buried in the earth, so you can't do it visually. We have to detect them underground. And uh, we can detect things underground. This is what geophysics is. This is what we do for a living. But if we look at, uh, forget this chart, it's all really boring except for this number. What this is showing us is over an eight year time period in Cambodia, humanitarian demining, 99.6% of the time was spent digging up trash. So you locate something underground and it might be a landmine, so you have to dig it up very carefully so that it doesn't explode and kill the deminer. And 99.6% of the time, you uncover a soda can or a rock or something that isn't a landmine. So the problem isn't necessarily detecting the landmines. It's discriminating landmines from junk. Because the little bit of money that the world manages to contribute towards humanitarian demining, <coughs> nearly all of that, 99 plus percent, goes towards trash collection. So the big challenge is how are we going to locate just the landmines and leave all the, ju the harmless junk there. Uh, some unpleasant statistics. I'm not going to go through these. I'm going to leave the slides if anybody wants them. Hopefully uh, the club will find a way to get them to you. But I'll point out one thing here, and that is if we go down, if we look at the second line, where is this a problem? We could go back to the map, but I'll just give it to you. About 65% of the world's poorest people, subsistence farmers, they're the ones who deal with landmine threats. So for instance, in Europe, in World War II, uh, much of Western Europe was mined, but it took only about four or five years after World War II ended to clear the fields. There are still some explosive remnants found in Italy and France and various places, but for the most part, you can walk safely through the fields of Western Europe and you'll be fine because the mines are gone. But in places like Vietnam, where the conflict has been over for 35, 40 years, the mines are still there. And in places like uh, Western Egypt, the mines are still there from World War II. So the, the first world countries, we managed to clean up after a war. But the people who are left with the mess are the world's poorest people. So 65% of the world's subsistence farmers live in countries where there's a landmine infestation. So we clear them. And in 2017, this is how landmine clearance is largely done. The guy on the top is working with a metal detector. So if mines contain uh, metal components or have a metal casing, you can find them with a metal detector, no problem. Uh, the other big tool for demining, and the woman on the bottom is using a, a, a knife. We call it a sapper spike. You can probe for mines. And the sapper spike works for mines that don't necessarily have any metal. So you can probe and feel them underground and then uncover them very carefully. This is how we're doing it in 2017. And for comparison, this is really fun. This is how they did it in 1945. <laughs> Not much different. <coughs> Not much different at all. We're still doing it the same darn way we did in 1945. There are programs that are using dogs, training dogs to sniff uh, explosive vapors. And this works pretty well. There are some drawbacks. Dogs are subject to olfactory fatigue, just like humans. If you walk into a smelly room, a few minutes later, you don't notice it. Your nose just blocks it out. Dogs have the same problem. Dogs develop a one-on-one -on -one relationship with their trainer. So if you want a dog to go to Cambodia to help with demining, you've got to bring the dog plus their handler. So it, they're great. I love dogs, but they're not going to be the worldwide answer to this. And everybody always asks about mechanical demining. Why can't you just uh, 
run a big machine through there that runs over the mines and blows them up, and you can. The problem with these machines is that you're running them over mines and blowing them up. So the machines <laughs> break down. And then you've got this gigantic machine that needs welding or some kind of repair. And so what we found happens in these poor third world countries, you send a big machine over like this, and it works for a few days, and then it breaks down, and then it sits there and rusts for the rest of its life. It, it, they just can't be maintained in parts of the world where we really need it the most. So what we've been working with is something called ground penetrating radar, and I'm not going to read you this whole thing. Just think of it this way. You can send a ping up into the sky, and if there's an airplane, it bounces off of it and comes back to you, and you get a blip on the screen. You've all seen that in the movies. We can do the same thing with radar, but aim it into the ground. As Jeff said, uh, it's like medical radiology, but we're doing it to the Earth instead. In this case, it's like tracking airplanes, but we're doing it to the Earth instead. We're sending a ping into the ground, and it bounces off things, and we get a blip on the radar screen. And that's what we see here. This is a, this is an Italian-made anti-tank mine, and it's buried. There are actually two of them in this diagram. So there's the ground surface, and this mine is buried, one shallow, one deep, and you can run a radar scanning device over it, and you get a ping. And there's the ping from this mine buried at that depth. Okay, that's nice. We get a ping. But just like the ping on an airplane radar screen, you can't tell what it is. It's just a blip. And remember, the problem is 99.6% of these blips are not mines. They're trash. So we've got to come up with a better way, some way to discriminate mines from trash. And the trickiest part is that some of these mines, this is a metal detector. It's the kind they'd screen you with in the airport. Um, but I'm just going to show you a couple of mines. This is an Italian made. Now, the Italians have signed the treaty, so they no longer make these. But I have a collection of mine casings. This is the actual mine, but without the explosives. And can you all hear that? There's definitely metal in that mine. So you can find that with a metal detector. Yeah, there's some metal in that mine. This is an American made M15 mine. These are littered all over Vietnam. There is a little bit of metal in that one. This is the mine that is most common in Bosnia. After the war in Bosnia, this is called the Paschieta, or the meat, the meat tin. No metal. Everything in here is plastic or carbon fiber. A metal detector will not detect this. Here's another one. These used to be made by the British and the Canadians. They've all signed the treaty now, but here's the fun part about that. They're supposed to destroy their own stockpiles, and all of these countries that signed the treaty have destroyed their own stockpiles. But they can't go to these non-state armed groups, and they can't go onto the black market and find all the mines that have gotten out there into the world and destroy those. So these mines that were made by countries that have signed the treaty, we still find them. They're still in use because somebody's got a shed somewhere packed full of these things, and they're easily put in the ground. It costs about $3 to make and plant a landmine. It costs about three to $500 to locate it and get it safely back out of the ground. So the economics are working against us. So we've got to be able to find mines and discriminate them from clutter. And we really need to be able to find these very small minimum metal to, to no metal, these plastic mines. So what we're working with is a holographic radar. It's, it's ground penetrating radar, but we're applying it in a completely different way. Instead of just getting a blip on the radar screen, we're using it to make a picture of the object underground. And this is a, this is, these are the nature of the images. So this was a test with a mortar shell, an inert mortar shell. And we bury it in dry sand about eight centimeters deep. And this scanning device that we've developed with this team of, uh, this international team of scientists we can scan the earth, and it will see through the material, it will see through the earth that's burying this and make this picture, as you see right here. So here's the actual shape of the mortar shell. And we scan the scanning device. We can pass it over the ground, and it sends uh, radar pulses into the ground, and they, they come back, and we record them and register them into an image. And this is the thing we're looking at. And the shape is really good. So if we know we're looking for this shape. We can scan the Earth and look for this, and we can say, ah, we know, we know what that is. So one of the things we'd really like to do is develop a system that doesn't take an expert being flown halfway around the world to operate it. 
It would be really nice if these poor farming communities could have their own experts, somebody that we train and give them a device, and if they discover that a field, a critical field, is, may have landmines in it, they have their own local person who can go do this, somebody who doesn't have years of training in geophysics. So we want to, do, we want to develop an instrument that will make really simple, simple pictures that anybody can interpret. And you've all just gotten your, your mine training, and I'm going to test you. <laughs> Sorry. These are the two most common mines in Ukraine right now, in eastern Ukraine. Both of these are Russian-made. On the left is the PMN2. On the right is the PMN4. The PMN4 is plastic, but you can see a little silver band. There is a metal band around it, so this one does have a little bit of metal. The PMN2 on the left is plastic. So I want you to look at those for a moment, and what do you notice? Well, what do you notice about the PMN2? Anybody? What's a characteristic feature of the PMN2? You can do it with your fingers if you want. Yeah, I saw, I saw, I saw this. Yep, the shape. Absolutely, the circular shape. The other thing about the PMN2 is that little cross on the top of it. The pressure plate, that's what you step on and it goes kaboom. So the PMN2, circular with the cross on top. The PMN4 is circular and it's got a little bit of, it's got that metal band, which it turns out on radar, that's a really good reflector. So there, it's a, there's this metal band around it, but it's basically circular. But I saw people making this shape. That's the key. So this is the shape of most landmines. <clears throat> so can you do it now? These are pictures of objects buried in the earth that we've taken pictures of with our holographic radar. And two of these are mines. The PMN2 and the PMN4 are up there. The other images of our, are of other things. They're junk. They're trash. They're things we don't want to bother to dig up at three to five hundred dollars a pop. We don't want to waste our demining money digging up stuff that's harmless. We just want to dig up the mines. So which ones are we going to dig up? I'll let you think about it. Oh, you got it. I saw everybody doing this. Right, okay. Well, let's work on that. Can you tell what some of the other objects are? Because this is fun too. Can you look at those shapes and take a guess as to what some of these other objects might be? Think about that for a moment. Beer can. Beer can. You, you can't imagine how good that is. It's actually a corn can, but can, yeah. The bottom center. Ooh, yes, it does. You know, that's good. We ought to be a little careful because that does have the shape of the old, the, the German potato masher, the <laughs> cylinder with the handle on it. Yeah, that, that's a good thought. So that one we might want to take a look at before we dig it up, before we say, okay, it's harmless. But no, this is a harmless item. Let's take a look. So, a pair of scissors in the upper left, a pipe wrench, that's pretty obvious once you see it, right? A, a cream of corn, soup, beer can, same thing. The one on the, on the bottom here is a Coke bottle. And if you look at it, you can kind of see the shape. It's got a skinny neck and then it gets fatter, and then it's got a kind of a wider base. It's a little Coke bottle. The one on the bottom is not a grenade, it's a spatula, but the shape is really good. And you are all exactly right. There's the PMN2, see the cross? Lower left, PMN4. So all of you, that's all the training you needed. You can do this, right? <laughs> Excellent. We're sending you all to, you're going to Cambodia, we're sending you to Yemen. You guys are ready. The trick is, we did this in a test bed. We did this in a, under carefully controlled conditions, which is what we need to do in science. But the real world doesn't have carefully controlled conditions. We need to adapt to this scanner to real world conditions. Like this is, this is a minefield in southern Lebanon. Here's one in Bosnia, one in Cambodia. Uh, the testing we do is in these lovely conditions in our test bed in Firenze or the test bed in the yard behind in Viroscan. We've got to adapt it to this. Our Italian colleagues are working on this. They're actually building a robotic device. We're working with the electrical engineering department at the University of Florence and they're building a robot that will carry this scanning device into the field so we can keep humans away from the mines. The current statistic is for every thousand mines that come out of the ground, a deminer is killed. So the demining job is a little bit dangerous. If we could have a robot doing it instead, that would be wonderful. <clears throat> Where we fit in on all this is this holographic radar tool that we've developed isn't perfect. It's not gonna work in all conditions, but it works really well in dry soils. And if we think back to the countries 
where there are landmine infestations, there are a lot of them that are semi-desert, <coughs> Afghanistan, Iraq, um, Yemen. There are lots of places around the world where this would work. We are, at the moment, trying to develop, we're trying to adjust it so that it will work in the soils in eastern Ukraine. So our mission at the moment is to try and adapt this to eastern Ukraine. The people who are supporting this, uh, the International Science and Technology Center, the Russian Foundation for Basic Research is funding us, NATO Science for Peace and Security, Franklin Marshall College, and especially EnviroScan, our local EnviroScan here. They've been tremendously helpful with all this work. And I have to thank, this is my field crew from August in eastern Ukraine. This is, this is the war zone. It doesn't look like a war zone. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's, it actually looks an awful lot like Lancaster County. <laughs> it is really rich farmland. And these folks, uh, were, some of them are from the, the National Academy of Sciences in Ukraine. Some of them are just local people who volunteered to help out with this. Uh, the women on the left, they actually spent one night during our field during our field work, they spent one night in their basements because their, their village was being shelled. Um, so these folks are great. They're committed. They're really doing the work. <laughs> notice, uh, did you notice the Ukrainian flag? I just have to point out something interesting about the Ukrainian flag. It's one of my favorite flags. Blue on the top and yellow on the bottom. There's a specific reason. That flag represents that. That's what Ukraine looks like. So their flag is, it shows whether it's uh, sunflowers or wheat fields, this is exactly what the Ukrainian flag is showing. And last picture, I snagged this. Just as we were walking out the door to come here, that picture you saw is in a farm field right here. And this is where the fighting is this morning. So all along this line, this is the front line between Ukraine and the militant republics. And fighting is broken out all along there. So we know that they're going to need this. Uh, this work is going to be important at some point. Thank you very much. I'll take any questions.